Hello, hello, everybody. This is Wani Angere and Moving Cultures, Women of the World Talk and Act, and the Cultural Stopovers. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where in the world you are at the moment. Today is Saturday, 5th of June, 2021, and this is the 30-minute series. And today, we have a remarkable woman as a guest to talk about her life, her journey, her challenges, and what the future is awaiting for. So her name is Virginia Piri from Zimbabwe. She is a remarkable woman, as I said before, and I'm not going to give you more details because she's going to tell us who she is. Welcome, Virginia. Thank you very much, Wane. I'm glad to be here and I feel very honored. Thank you so much. And we it's are. Not every, it's not every day that we get an opportunity like this, and I appreciate it so much. And also the fact that you're promoting not only women, but everybody else, including children. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And we are also very proud that you are one of the prime cultural stopovers and moving culture women of the world token act members. You've been very active and you were also one of our guests of honors during uh, international women's celebration in Kenya. Who is Virginia Pitt? Well, Virginia Peary was born and bred in Zilirazi Township, Gobulawayo, Zimbabwe's second largest city. So growing up in the township in those days, people thought it was not an advantage because the children who grew up in the township were supposed to be something else, naughty and everything else, but that was not true. We were there because our families had come to work and we had to be with them. And at the same time, there was so much that we had to learn and get by, go to school. The community actually was so nice that even as children, our parents were not our parents alone. They were also parents to other children. And those mothers and fathers and grandfathers and everybody else, aunts, they were also our mothers, our aunts, everybody. It was really a community. And we grew up so well. We, we tried by all means not to be naughty, of course, as children, it's very normal, but we learned quite a lot. We also helped work at home. We also did a lot of sports. We took our studies very seriously, even though it was African education, we had seen relatives who had gone to school. Some of them were nurses, some of them were teachers. At that time, in my time when I was growing up then, when I was a little girl in the 60s, I don't remember any of our relatives or close people I knew that were either doctors or something else beyond teachers and nurses. So also as little girls, what we learned in books at school was something totally different. But I was always very curious. I actually played sport. I was an athlete. I played netball. I swam. And I used to borrow magazines and I read a lot of cartoons and I read a lot of books and old newspapers, everything. I was so curious that when adults were listening to news in the local languages in Debele or Shona, I will sit and listen as well, knowing what's going on in the world, including when the first Americans landed on the moon. I also, at school, I really had the teacher ask I was the first one to tell the whole story. So strictly speaking, everything, in fact, I became sporting, I became a musician even, you know, when I was a teenager. So it all comes from this community, the mentors that we didn't realize were mentoring us. 
apart from the manners and all that and education, everything else. The mentoring took place in the township within ourselves. And then it spilled over to other communities where we were not allowed to mix and mingle. That was the white community and the so-called Indian communities and the, what they used to call the colored communities at that time. We were not so, you know, there was apartheid at that time. And people only realized that apartheid was in South Africa most of the time. But we also really had apartheid in our areas. There was a time we were told that our adults were not supposed to buy anything in the shop support from the windows. So all that, I mean, I've always been very curious and notorious, but not notorious in a destructive way, but just being mischievous, you know, learning this and doing that, trying this experiment. Even my teachers at primary school already, I got my grades were very high. I was mostly first class most of the times. So I competed with a lot of boys and girls, but my goal was to excel in whatever I did, whether I was doing music, sport, or whatever, and everything else. But at home also, I had to excel to be trying to be a good girl, do the cleaning, doing the cooking, doing everything else. And my uncle, whom I stayed with, he liked to have his hair shaved off, you know? I used to shave off with a razor, clean shaven, that's what he liked. So already at about the age of 10 or 11, I was doing that and many other things. And my cousins, my sisters and everybody, I mean, it was just nice. So reading also became very serious in such a way that I got tired as a teenager to read what we called um, cartoons and the like. I thought I was a bit grown up. And then some teenage girls were already reading Mills and Booms. And I find them too, well, not for me. I went for James Huddle Chase. And I really used to borrow the books from the community there, the bigger boys and girls says, well, that's not for you. And I said, I think I like them. And I read almost all the series. And when that finished, I really got bored. I started you know, experimenting at home. There was a box of books of my uncle. And uh, well, we were told not to touch that box. So I had a trick. I opened the back of the box, put wires on it, started going through books and reading and all. And in the end, I read books that I was not supposed to read. And um, one of the books that I read was of called Lady Cattle's Lover, which actually was not supposed to be read by young people. This was D.H. Lawrence. And I thought, well, um, maybe I should hide it and then read it when I can with my little friend, Prisca, actually. So we all tried to read something bigger than we were. When I was in Form 1, I was caught by my teacher and asked me what I was reading. And I said, oh, well, it's a book. And he said, let's see. And when he saw what it was, I was shocked because I didn't realize that it was so serious. Then he asked, how far had you gone? Have you gone with this book? And I said, uh, <laughs> I went, uh, I've gone as far as when the, uh, the madam of the house was visiting the gamekeeper. Oh, the teacher just snatched the book, took it out. I said, when you are grown up, you can collect the book. So that was the beginning, I think, of my reading and writing. And then I explored into all sorts of other books and at school, it became something else. Then came music. In the local community, there was a band that practiced at McDonald's Hall. And I seemed to like music. One of my brothers loved the music as well. We had it at home. And I got really interested. I was high school. I went to beg these guys already working and just explain and beg them until they agreed on the understanding that I studied. I got my grades well, I behaved at home, then I'll be allowed. By the time I became at the peak of um, 
of this musical career, I was a little rock star in the township. We went to the teen times, people attended our shows. I drove almost everybody crazy, even up to now, those people who used to attend were about my age, some younger, some older, still remember. And I really, in fact, if I was in the United States, I would have been somewhere, maybe Beverly Hills, Hollywood or whatever. But thank God I didn't get that far. Maybe I'll be dead now because that's the time people were, were dealing with purple hearts and all and drugs and everything. Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix time and the rest of it. It was really music. But that music also brought some sort of rebelliousness within the young people it became a movement. It sort of liberated our minds and liberated a few things to such an extent that the other young youngsters, teenagers from the white community and other communities started hanging out with us in the township. You know, they will come to Stanley Square, they will come to Bubblefield Stadium, they will do all sorts of things. And at one time, our band, the High Chords, was led by Epa Chitambo, there was Benson, and then there was Dave, and there was Handsome and myself. We really were kettle raisers for Edson, Lighters, and Christie, the bands that had come from the UK through South Africa. Oh, I didn't even realize I'd become a star overnight. So it was really nice. I enjoyed it. I'll never forget that. From then on, school was going on. Everything was going. There wasn't much money. That we, It was really fun. And that's where everything else happened. And then I went into the wilderness when things were really hot in the township. And then later on came back and to go back to start school and study accountancy and became an accountant. And after becoming an accountant, I was also getting bored easily. I started scribbling and I was a founder member of Zimbabwe Women Writers with my seniors, Barbara Nkala, Colette Mtangadura, and Tietzam Sengezi, Monica Skeet, and many others. So that's how we developed and I became a little writer after work writing. And then we came up with anthologies and everything else. Writing became part of my life. And then at the age of about 46 in 2000, I actually um, quit accountancy. My immediate boss had retired. I felt I'd done my part. I went into consultancy and I wanted to write and travel because now I was attending conferences on women writing, conferences on this and that. I was already on the board of Zimbabwe International Book Fair, on the board of uh, Zimbabwe Women Writers. And I also was a founder member of Zimbabwe Academic and Nonfiction Authors um, Association, which was founded in 1996. Zimbabwe Women Writers has been founded in 1990. Of course, there was Zimbabwe Writers Union, but for these two organizations, nothing was being cut out for them. So they had to go and do their own thing. And then that's how it all went. And from there on, all the women's movement, they call the women's movement, I was into everything, fighting for the rights of the women, the laws that we also lobbied, helped lobbying. I remember the last serious one I lobbied was the sexual offenses bill when the HIV came along and all, and then later on. And I'm still in the women's movement, of course. This is why the one has invited me and I do all sorts of things. I mean, I've been almost, I'm not bragging, but I've been in many countries, in Africa, in Europe, in the Americas, in all. And uh, I have not yet ventured into uh, Asia. Last year, I was supposed to have traveled to India. But anyway, COVID came along. That was the first time in Asia. But I've been everywhere, all over. I've been lucky in such a way. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm one of the, there's so many other writers, but I've been blessed. I've actually written about, I've been involved in writing, for instance, women writing Africa, Southern African region, where um, people like uh, Wayne Mandela were featured, and I dealt with the section where they were talking of the women in the liberation struggle. 
And I also was an associate ed editor team of that. And you can understand how it was. It was really an honor. And then from then on, we moved on. And recently, not so long ago, I was commissioned, well, 2012, to portray Wangari Matai, the first Black Nobel Prize winner in a book called African Visionaries or Visionary Africas in German. That's when it was published first in 2014. And then in 2019, known as African Visionaries, published uh, by Sub-Saharan publishers in Accra, Ghana, in English. So in other, I've been really fortunate, and I'm not quite sure. I was terrified, in fact, when I was commissioned for Wangari Matai, because that was supposed to have been done by a Kenyan. I'm not quite sure what happened, but then they approached me. And I asked Professor Diallo, who's best in German, I said, but Professor Diallo, I, I, do you think I can manage the Virginia? You, you just, I realized it was an opportunity. At the same time, I was terrified. At the same time, I realized I had to take it. So I managed. And all these, and I mean, well, I must say, I'm lucky. I also, I try to work hard. I try to inspire. And I've also mentored a lot of writers, not only women, not only young, but seniors, not only from my country, from other countries as well. And I deal with almost, I mean, on humanitarian issues, I also deal with that. I'm also an African orchid expert, appointed by Dr. Mike Fay of Kew Royal Botanical Garden in England, first of all, around 2012 on Africa Committee. And now I sit on the IUCN Species Survival Commission because of my knowledge of nature, environment and all, and the African orchids especially. Of course, I do also deal with exotics, but I concentrate on the African orchids and have written, co-authored more than 70 articles in orchid journal, especially the Die Orchidee in Germany. In Zimbabwe, we don't have much of journals because there's no budget for it. But we do a lot of contributions at the National Herbarium on dried specimen, at least more than 50 dried specimen information. And some of the journals, we also let them have it so that the students can learn. Sharing, being in science, you don't make money, you share information, it's research. And most of the research work that I've done with my husband and colleagues and others, it's our own resources, not that we are rich, but it's a matter of wanting to research and leave a legacy for people to study later on and share. And all these articles in these uh, journals are shared everywhere, herbariums, libraries, students, universities, everywhere. So I would say I love to do everything else that I want to do, I'm fortunate. And at the same time, I feel I also have to look at lives. Now we have COVID and there's so much that has gone on. I also deal a lot with children's literature and reading stories, visiting schools, book fairs, events and all. And when COVID came, oh, that was it. It's a situation where I felt completely destroyed and my colleagues and as a chair of IBBY, um, Zimbabwe section is part of IBBY International, there was no way I was going to give up. So I came up with a plan recorded stories on my phone at home, lockdowns and all, experimented a bit, saw the idea to my colleagues, they bought it. And then I said, well, we have no funding, we have nothing. Let's just use our phone and see what happens. Eventually we managed, that was last year in 2020, around April, May, June. By September, stories had been recorded. We said each one of us would, Eventually, 
we would maybe get some money. Eventually we did. IPBY eventually helped us this year to um, launch CDs for children. We had gone to celebrate their children's literature day or children's book day 2021 at the beginning of April, but we didn't make it on time. We did manage to launch the three CDs by myself, Virginia Piri, Greenfield Chilongo, and Josephine Muganiwa at the Harare City Library. Of course, under COVID conditions, controlled for gathering numbers and order and everything went on very well. The CDs will be for free. They'll go to schools, they'll go to library. In fact, they've already gone and other related institutions, including the University of Zimbabwe, because they also deal with children's literature and other universities we also get the copies these are for free thanks to ibby international for making funds available to have these cds produced the stories are mixed some are folk tales uh, which have been panel bitted and brought into the modern and some are brand new stories about life and the like and also we are looking into stories that will also bring the the COVID part of it, that was volume one. Now we're working on volume two and it's coming out very well. And some of us are recording, of course, I'll be recording tomorrow to finish part of my five stories. We'll also be doing the stories, not only in English, but in local languages. Josephine Mganiwa did partly in English and Chindau. I'll be doing some in Debele. The others in Sipa will be doing Shona. Memory Chire will be doing in Shona in English. And then also uh, Tinashe Muchuri will also be doing Shona. He loves to do Shona. And then we bring others into the fold and bring not only seasoned writers, we are also trying to mentor more, even younger writers to write for children as well. And um, they've been tried and people seem to be enjoying them. So we're carrying on. I think COVID has also taught us to not to just sit and mourn, but to do something. Because I didn't, I could not imagine not think doing literature for children. I mean, that was, it had to be done. So I'm glad we've done that. And there's so much that is actually going on. Now we are all trying with our masks and everything, we are working and we're trying to be careful. The children have just closed schools. And when they open the next term, the second, a volume of the CDs should be ready. Virginia. Know, uh, yes, Yeah, no, it's, it, you've been very productive. I think since you early childhood till today, you have done I'm so sure much. And, you, <laughs> and it's, a, it's like a wheel that is rolling, 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 and never stop. Let's talk about controversial material and literature that you have put on the table, like uh, women on the liberation struggle and also gender uh, issues. What can you tell us about that? Um, the women on the liberation struggle has been a thorny issue because it was very difficult. I mean, already in the 80s, the situation is people do not understand that the liberation struggle had its own problems. Yes, it was to liberate people, but it also left scars, not only physical scars on the bodies, but it left scars in the minds of the people, the heads of the people, psychological issues and the like. And also that affected families. For instance, on the women, on the female part, the women, when they came back, it was well and good. The men were also welcome, but the situation was, there was discrimination. If a man went to try and marry a woman somewhere, people would ululate and be happy that, oh, a comrade is marrying our daughter or our niece or something that was breaking everywhere. But if a woman who had gone to war was trying to get married, there would be in-laws, the mother-in-laws, the sisters, the relatives, oh, he's marrying a comrade. It doesn't work. And could we find you a wife or any? It was so difficult for most of these women to get married. Even if they did get married, it didn't last because they were always labeled, oh, how could you, how to, it had actually 
you know, it, it was just difficult. At the same time, they also wanted to have families. They also wanted to have husbands, to have partners, to have friends. But it was very discriminatory. And most of the women in the end it ended up getting divorced, getting depressed, getting into alcohol and many other things. And some were so depressed that at times, I'm sorry to say, they passed on and people thought they were, they'd gone mad or they'd gone crazy, but it was actually depression that had gone over. And at the same time, you find that most, it was a bit later when most of the women going to war started marrying people from out of their communities or people from other countries or away from, of course, there are those who accepted them who are still even married up to now, but few families did accept that. And as for writing about women who went to war was very difficult. They wouldn't write it themselves. So Zimbabwe women writers uh, decided that it was high time that a book was written, the women ex-combatants were interviewed. It was called Women of Resilience. And that was the time when things were really hot and it was difficult to get permissions to, you know, some of you were reluctant, some were scared, some were worried and all and everything else. But through persuasion, because it was justified, nothing had happened, nothing had been said by the local women about the women who had gone to war. So eventually Zimbabwe women writers and others came in together and um, worked and came up with this book, which were interviews of women and it really involved everybody else who was supposed to, it's a bit difficult now looking at the whole thing, it's still said because there's still not much. And on the male side also, it's the same sort of story. So I'm not quite sure what is supposed to be done. Women are going into other issues. And at the same time, these women also are getting older and some have passed on and things are difficult. We still have to work on the women ex combatants again. That was an attempt, it was an anthology. There were many women involved there. If I'm not mistaken, Wani, I think you came to the launch of that book, isn't it? You yes. actually, uh, yes, at the book yes. cafe. Yes, and then you actually donated your music and we launched the book. And yes, I remember that very well. That's the first time we met. That's yes. a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Wani. It's a situation where I'm still into women's issues, writing. Apart from that, I've also written my own works, as you know. I've worked on women sex workers, my first book, Desperate, The Causes of Prostitution in Dead World Countries, which actually looks at sex workers as desperate, like the topic. And then I also looked into issues like, at that time, LGBTQ had not come on, but I was already dabbling in that area. And I came up with this book, Destiny that was published in, Desperate was 2002. Destiny was published in 2006. I had to look into that. And at that time, nobody believed that the situation of LGBTQ did exist. But in that book, I had to bring it. And I remember at that time reading another book which had been written by Jeffrey Egwenedes I think originally from Greece, but uh, best in Germany. And at that time, somebody says, well, at that time, there were only two books that actually explained the situation. And I talked about that and I presented in 2014 in Johannesburg, uh, an essay that I had written about destiny and uh, Jeffrey Egonides books. And then it was all compiled and we discussed it. And now it looks like the topic is openly discussed and talked about. Of course, certain countries, you know, frown upon it, but 
it, that's how it is. We have to talk about this. Is we have to discuss. It's part of our life. We cannot run away from that, and that's it. And then I also move on on my other book that came and Highway Queen. This is actually the crisis that we go through, not only in Zimbabwe, in many other countries. Economics, yeah, where women really are desperate. Families, the economy has died. Nothing is cooking. Women actually go out to do what they're not supposed to do, but they go to peggle themselves, to look after their families and all. In the case of Highway Queen, the woman actually, when she was a married woman with a husband, with the children, staying with the mother-in-law, but she had no choice but going there to do what she had to do. Many people have read that book. The settings are local and everything else is going on. And that's it. It's a situation where we need, and I like fiction. I love fiction because fiction talks about us, about ourselves. And fiction gives you the freedom to tell a story without a problem. It's our story. It's everybody's story. And I love fiction. And then also I, on my uh, latest, which is Grey Angels, I dabble into all sorts of things. In fact, I love the taboos because nobody wants to talk about them and I'll keep on. And my next book that I'm working on right now is called Robbed of Dignity. It's still about women. I had researched this sort of book throughout economies of strife, wars and things. I looked into the Liberian, Sierra Leone and other countries and all, not knowing that well here at home as well to catch up with us. So everything else came to actually in one port where women have actually suffered most in times of crises wars and all they've been part of like you know they get punished for things they didn't start they are, women are not warmongers it is males who are warmongers and then the women suffer for it the women are punished for it and that goes down their children suffer a lot because the men are not there and nobody bothers and nobody wants to know so robbed of dignity is I take my time, of course. My books take time because I, you research and you research again and you write again and you look at situations. You see, my traveling helped me to see, to talk, to see places, to actually see things and that's it. Because people thought even with, with fiction, you don't research, oh no, you do. It's even more because you get into it. You become part of it. And then by the time the book is published, it has to be something credible. And I remember the women who taught me to write, people like Barbara Nkala, Chiedz, and Sengizi, and others, Dangaduras and the like, they said, if it's not cooked, just don't get it out. And Norma Kitson used to say, Virginia, you have potential. And this is your line. Norma Kitson was a, a South African woman who was here, who was in the struggle. She stayed in Zimbabwe. We were together in Zimbabwe. And I always say, I look back and I always say, it rings in my head. It's not cooked, so I can't get it out. My books take years. And I, I stick to that. And I think I love that. I'm lucky because my family actually accept all that nonsense that I write. And I'm glad that even the people, the few people I hang out with, because a lot of people are reluctant to hang out with Virginia, of course, you know, it's a bit complicated and hard, but anyway, never mind. Uh, those who, who, who feel they want to come close to me, okay, we get close, people like Wani and others. <laughs> I, <laughs> Virginia. I, we yes. have reached the 35 minutes of conversation and you okay. have proved that the power of the voice and the power of the words are a healing tool for communities. You come from a storyteller's 
lineage, you know, that has managed to understand from early age that she was meant to come to this world with a message of transformation. Can you please give us your closing remarks of this conversation? Yes, um, first of all, we have to converse, we have to talk. We can't be silent. I know it's difficult. They're touchy issues and all. If we don't talk about them, they'll never get into the public. We need to flush out. It could be economics, it could be politics, it could be religion, it could be anything, it could be whatever. Talk about it. And let's write it. Of course, we come from a, a tradition that spoke the, the words got lost somewhere or got distorted. But if we put it, if we write it, Virginia is gone dead and buried, people will still read it. I will still be talking to all of you and everybody else will read. Not that I'm giving recipes, but I'm telling a story. Those stories relate to us. Once we write, I mean, now the CDs, it might not end up being CDs, like I said, it will end up as books as well, because CDs maybe the shelf life. When we write it, when we say it, it's there. It can also be read and shared, dramatized, made into film, meant into songs and everything else. And that's how life is. We, even the wars that are there, we can criticize them, talk about them. Who wants war? Nobody. Who wants hunger? Nobody. Who wants oppression? Nobody. We just have to do what we have to do as writers, especially women, because the women are the guardians of us all, as we know. That's why we, we have Mother Earth, and that's it. So we really have to do what we have to do, put it down, write it, say it. By writing, you are making a big statement, and no one will take it away from you. It's written, it's there, it exists, doesn't go anywhere. And it remains in the memories of people. Now we have this digital era, it's digitized as well, convenient, like now on COVID, electronic books are working. My, all my books are now electronic, they've been always been electronic. And as if I knew, here we are. They're used for research, institutions, they are used in universities and schools, and the films are coming up, people are now beginning to have an interest in all, there's not much money, but it's coming up slowly, and I think we, that's it. Okay, thank you, Virginia. I'm going to share a little extract of an interview you have recently to close our conversation. And once again, thank you so much for your powerful message. Thank you for being always positive and ready to transform your life and the life of others because you are a role model and a mentor and people is looking at you as a way to survive so let's see the video thank you wani for actually giving me this opportunity i appreciate this so much it means a lot let's look at you on the interview All right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. <laughs> Hmm. 
Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Uh, that so was much. a very powerful message to end up this 30 minutes with Virginia Piri, who is a writer. She's a women's rights advocate. She's an orchid expert. She's a, an accountant. She's a storyteller. And the list goes on, on, and on. And we are so proud and happy to have her in our community. So blessings, Virginia. Keep Thank shining. You. Thank you. And God keep you healthy and strong. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Goodbye, Thank Virginia. <laughs>